Metal, Metal slug. slug. Heavy machine gun. Thank you. Thank you. Heavy machine gun. Thank you. Heavy machine gun.
I think that the reason that people will like or dislike Spawn is because of the attitude of him. And that he hasn't been quite as polished as a lot of mainstream characters that are out there, Superman and, and Batman and Spider-Man and stuff like that. But because he still has those little kind of cuts on him and those things that can kind of hook you, I think that's the reason for his success. I think it's that, that mentality of of, and it's not intentional, but why people like stuff like Rambo First Blood, that, that my guy isn't, he, didn't, he doesn't push first. But when, he, when you do push him, he'll, he pushes back with, with meaning. And so I think Spawn is in that pocket that's, I don't want to say adolescence. I, adolescence is, is, is being too much of a stereotype, but adolescence in terms of right here. You know, I, I mean, I'm 35 and I think I'm still a kid. When I look at a lot of video games, I look at them more for, like, if I could play it, would that be cool? And so, again, when I go to video arcades and stuff, I can sit there and go, well, I've never played any of these, but if I was going to plunk down my 50 cent, this would be the game right here. Because it just has, again, either a feel to it, the characters are neat, the action's kind of cool, the sound effects, something there that, to me, this is the best one in the room. There's a million fight games out there on some level. There's a million scroll, scrolling games. So how can we kind of take little bits and pieces of these things and not create something completely original? Because it's like, you know, none of us are that good that we can come up with that wholly original idea. But how can we make this thing slightly different? That's really the goal. I'm trying to keep Sony in the mindset, and they've been very good so far, of trying to go, let's just do a little bit of this and this and this. And we hope that the whole becomes better than the parts. What I do see myself doing, and I think people aren't paying attention, is that, especially people within the comic book world, is that when I'm not drawing the pages, and I'm going, how come you're not penciling the book anymore? And it's because I'm creating toys, I'm creating a show, I'm creating a movie, I'm helping to create video games. So I'm not stopping the creative process. Right. I'm just moving it someplace else. So, so I still always see myself creating. Right. It just might, some of it is in a public arena, and some of it is in a private arena. I still see myself doing a lot of what I'm doing right now, not losing the passion. Right. It just might not be as in your face. At the end of the day, I go play ball. I take the kids for a walk in the park and, you know, say hi to my wife, and, and I'm, I'm pretty bland, you know? It's just that, because people have, I think people have an odd tendency to say, what kind of psycho thinks these things up? But, but the thing is, is at least in my example here, and I, I, I got to believe most of this is true, I sleep like a baby. I don't remember my dreams, and when I wake up, I feel good and I re feel refreshed, and then I go into my office and I create mayhem. Oh, I'm telling you, bud, it's the only thing I haven't conquered in life is baseball. So I'm telling you, that phone rings right now, and it's Marge shot, and she wants me to patrol center field for the Reds. I'm out of here. I dump all this, like... So, I mean, do I like Spawn? Oh, of course I do. But would I like to play center field in Cincinnati? You betcha. You know, I mean, that's, that was, when I was a kid, that was the first thing that I, I mean, sports was everything, you know. To get the gospel spread, you have to do these things. And part of getting people to know about your product is you have to, like, get it out to literally millions of people. You have to use these vehicles, movie being one of them, that are, are accessible ways to get people to it. And you just go, okay, well, we needed a movie. It would, we, needed, we needed a video game that maybe sold 3 million units. It's too bad it didn't sell 30 million units, right? You know, because again, every guy doesn't have one. So, well, who doesn't have one? We've got to go hit them with something else. I don't really know. You know, again, what can you do with most superpowers? People have asked me, like, if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Well, that's an easy one, world peace, you know. <laughs>
okay, I'm done, you know, and it's like that. I, you, you're done in one day. But anything less than that, you know, is kind of like, well, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do with it? I think if I had superpowers, I don't know that I'd save anybody from bank robbers. I'd, I'd probably just make sure that I took care of all the little personal things in my life, you know. So that guy's had my lawnmower for three months. I'm, I'm gonna kick his friggin' <laughs> garage in. I'm gonna get my lawnmower and piss on him if he wants it. You know, it's mine. So, and, and, and that makes sense to him. So, so he functions on the small level given that he's a pawn in, 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 a, in a chess game called Armageddon between heaven and hell. So there, here's the big thing. But, but he, he doesn't get it. That's, it's too much for him. But he gets the little personal stuff. All the other stuff that heaven and hell is kind of throwing down upon him is just noise, and he just wants some peace and quiet. Again, the original goal was to have Spawn become a household name, but the, an the real answer is to have Spawn become a, a half a household name. And it's the guy upstairs that's got the music blaring that gets it, that's like going, and, and so that's the half of the house we gotta hit. It seems like everything is kind of getting, kind of being shot down to this kind of five to nine year old mentality. And to me, I don't really want Spawn swimming in that pool. I just think that once kids hit adolescence, all they really give them is really maybe some music and, and video games. And that seems like to be the only thing we really target at them. And, 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 and so, why can't there be something out there? Why can't there be the equivalent of an MTV character out there, which is what my guy is, that, that mom and dad doesn't get it. Uh, dad gets it. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. Dad will get it. Dad just won't endorse it when mom's around, right? So mom won't get it. So she's not going to endorse it. Dad just goes, just keep it away from mom. Hi, I'm Jason Rubin from Naughty Dog. We're here today to give you a behind the scenes look into the making of Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back. Crash Bandicoot 2 has a very refined gameplay. We took the response we got from players of Crash 1 and the knowledge we gained in creating the first product and sharpened the focus of gameplay in the sequel. Well, well, well. If it isn't Crash Bandicoot, welcome. Instead of a linear map, Crash 2's levels are accessed through a workroom, allowing players to choose which levels he or she would like to attempt next. The levels are larger, with more branch, and they allow greater freedom of movement with camera control. There are far more secret areas, with over one-third of the game off the main path. The arts changed drastically between Crash 1 and Crash 2. Crash 1's engine was thrown out. Crash 2's engine is totally new. It allows us to have more polygons in the background, more frames of animation in Crash, more detailed environments, and the ability to do neat environmental uh, effect things that bring the viewer in, bring the player in, and make them feel like they're in a real environment. It has procedural rain, which is actual 3D raindrops that come through the environment. When the camera looks down, the rain actually moves as if it's in 3D, and you're looking at a down angle with the rain on a snow level, when you're running into the snow, the snow comes at you and makes you feel like you're in the level. We have a specular renderer on our gems, which allow the gems to look like gems as opposed to look like really flat-shaded things rotating. We have reflection effects in the ice that make Crash Bandicoot and everything else in the environment reflect in the ice, making it really feel like ice. We've been able to add a whole slew of new things to each and every level based on the fact that instead of saying, okay, let's go make Crash 1.5, use the same engine, make some new levels, we did Crash 2. The character animations improved greatly. We have 15 times as much storage for animation in the game and over 20 times as much animation totaled in the game, allowing almost every death to have its own unique animation that goes along with it. Not only can you walk, jump, run, but you can also ride on the back of a bear cub. You can run away from a boulder. You can ride on a jet ski. 
You can ride on a jet pack that's actually free floating in zero gravity. You can do a lot of things you never did before. And you can do a lot of things that you've never seen before in any other game. For example, there are levels where Crash can jump up in the air, spin around, and dive underground, creating a little mound. And he can then move around as this mound, getting by everything that's on the surface, but still attacking them by sticking his arm up and spinning them away. One of the cool new things in Crash Bandicoot 2 are the, the lip-synced, like, holographic characters in, in the warp room. These are particularly cool because they're a combination of tons of people on the team's individual efforts. You got like animators who had to do the facial expressions, the lip syncing with the, the dialogue, the, the textures, and you had programmers doing like the, the holographic effect, the lens flare, audio, video spooling and lip syncing. And it all comes together and brings a, an artificial character to life in a way that I don't think we've seen before in video games. Another thing I'm really proud of is the way in which we, we utilize the resource of the CD to bring to the player levels that are probably about 10 times as large as the memory of the PlayStation. We do this by kind of laying the whole level out on disc and bringing it in piece by piece in a transparent manner. This is a really complicated, tricky technology somewhere between spooling and virtual memory, and it enables us to use the CD to bring more detail, more game objects, just more stuff into the game. Another thing we're proud of is the sheer number of polygons we muscle through the crash engine. Just a real lot of detail on the screen, and I think that we can pretty much say that no other next generation game has as much background detail as Crash does. Over 40,000 comic book fans recently came together in San Diego, California for this year's Comic-Con International. Since it's the largest comic convention in the United States, every comic book publisher was represented. Because many of the comic characters also star in the hottest video games, the PlayStation folks were on hand to give conventioneers a taste of the upcoming titles. The PlayStation Underground brought the cameras along to show you what goes on inside a comic convention of this magnitude. As you can see, comics were not the only focus of this show. Many of the booths were lined with toys, games, collectibles, and every other comic-related item you can think of. These are just a couple of the comic characters you'll see in upcoming video games. And this is just some of the cool stuff that can be found at every booth. <laughs> Looks like just about everyone's a subscriber. Ever wonder what some of those props from the movies look like up close? Check these out. Where comic book art leaves off, gameplay begins. Can a comic book such as Spawn be successfully translated into an interactive video game? Fans at the show seem to think so, once they tested the upcoming Spawn game on PlayStation. They also took a liking to the PlayStation Underground CD, grabbing up thousands of copies, as well as other valuable reading material. If you get the chance, we at the PlayStation Underground highly recommend attending Comic-Con International. You never know who you might meet. It has 22 wheels, weighs almost 40 tons, and cost over a million bucks to build and operate for a year. Inside, 55 people at a time can preview unreleased PlayStation games in air-conditioned comfort. It's the PlayStation truck. Soon, it could be coming to a town near you. Right now, it's logging 5,000 miles a month, appearing at sporting events, concerts, fairs, and festivals in a year-long tour.
What makes it all work out? Special technology and a unique team of three people. I've been driving the, big, the bigger trucks uh, probably 30 years. Well, it's the smoothest ride I've ever had because of the additional axle on the trailer. I got lucky and got two good guys to work with. We got a good thing going, the three of us here. I'm 25 years old. I like what I do, and I wouldn't trade it for any other job right now. I'm 26 years old, going on 14. I'm a tour manager, and we basically run the truck. Setup at the start was taking about, I'd say, six to seven hours with approximately about five people. Now that we've been on the tour for about four months, and we've probably got it down about two, two and a half hours on setup and breakdown. Well, the Sony PlayStation truck can hold 55 people at one time. There's 33 consoles in there that are the top games. There's about 12 to 13 unreleased games. Our featured game today is Car World Series. This Car World Series is not yet on the market. This truck has just about everything that your living room would have. We have nice recliner leather chairs. We do have a big screen TV, which is an eight foot video wall that we run championship games on it. It's by far the number one exhibit at any place we go to. People don't know exactly what we are or who we are, but as soon as they find out, everybody's there. The truck opens up both sides. Boom, you get people, 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 people. You gotta almost tear these kids' fingers off the controllers to get them out of there to let some of these other people in line. Our target demographic is, uh, you know, 15, 16 to 25, but, you know, we get 5 to 50. I love this truck. This is a pretty cool truck, actually. Parents come up to, you know, the front of a very long line and say, oh, you know, I just, my child's in there, I just have to get my child, we've got to go. You know, and then coming in the truck and seeing that parent tucked away in a corner somewhere, you know, just going at one of the games. It's got a lot of PlayStation games in it, for one. Uh, a lot of TVs, a lot of hookups. Sound system's great. The PlayStation truck. 60,000 visitors in the first five months. It could be coming soon to a parking lot near you. Check PlayStation on tour at www.playstation.com.
Actually, I was out of a job, and I called a temporary agency. They asked on the phone if I'd like to play video games. <laughs> I was like, yeah. They did a phone interview, and I came in for a training for a week, and uh, passed the training and started in consumer service. How I see people breaking into the industry is like through consumer service or the test department. And uh, what consumer service does is answer technical questions on the PlayStation, warranty and stuff like that. Whenever you have a problem with the PlayStation, you call up an 800 number and we'll help you out with it. Hello, this is Matthew. I actually started as a tester, and so I knew people who worked here at Sony, and, um, and I heard that there was openings here in consumer service. I'm a senior tip writer. Basically what I do is I write tips, hints, strategies, whatever for Sony published games. I started out working some customer service and from there I went into their test department after about a year. I would like to get into uh, game design and or, and or going into 3D animation. What I'd like to do in the industry probably over time is do um, like produce or you know, games, which like is starting as like associate producer, assistant producer, game design would be really good. But personally, I wouldn't mind getting into the development side. I joined Sony about three, four years ago with Dave Jaffe. And our first part of the work out together was, was Mickey Mania, that was on Traveler's Tales. Since then, uh, Dave and I originally started Twisted Metal uh, 1 together. He went on to complete it. Um, I peeled off and worked on Warhawk. My most recent project is Jet Moto, and I've been exec producing over Jet Moto 2 with Brian Wicklum. I'm somewhat prejudiced against producers who have never been through test, and there's not a lot of them. The testers are, the, are, are, in a sense, a test bed for the guys who've had the game for two months, three months. And those are the guys, I think, that really are the test of your audience. But for the real gamers, which the industry is getting bigger and bigger, and there are more and more cool, real gamers out there, they want their games to give them an experience, something that, that lasts. I don't think a sane person would do this. A tester's responsibility is to basically test the uh, functionality of a game. For example, a product like Crash Bandicoot. Their responsibility is to die at every location, test all the TNT crates for dying, test all collision, you know, all the walls, barriers, uh, get to the end of the level, collect all the little goodies, you know, secrets, hints, stuff like that. So basically, they need to check everything. I mean, it's not just play it. Play it is something other than testing. Because you see so much product, because you live with it, eat it, breathe it, you become exposed to so many different products that you get more experience in a particular genre, in a particular mechanic, than people get in a lifetime of game playing. If you have your most hated video game, I would say play it for a month straight. If you can do that and continue to play it regardless, I'd say then, yeah, you can be a first party tester. Who wouldn't want a job playing video games? Greatest job in the world. Very difficult and challenging. Stressful, rewarding, and uh, oh, I love it. It's the greatest job in the world. More stressful. <laughs> awesome. Tell me to buy a brand new car. I can't believe they pay me for this. I'm addicted to video games. My job, my job rocks! It gets chicks. The job's absolutely wonderful. I love this job. Oh, I love it. It's fun. I love my job. It's the least stressful job I've ever had. It's excellent. Lots of overtime, but lots of fun. It's the bomb. Can't beat it. This is the best job I've ever had. The work in here got me this game. I think the most that I like about my job is that I can see games before my friends. I like it a lot. Lots and lots and lots. Most of all the jobs start off uh, temporary. Just call a temporary agency. Uh, well, if you want a job for me right now, I'd say send me, send me <laughs> a resume. <laughs>
Underground, cool. Hi. <laughs> and here we see the lovely Susan Michelle. Peace. Hi. <laughs> what are you guys doing? I'm being ill and playing the calculator. Cut myself out of it. Who wouldn't want a job playing video games? <laughs> what is the expected response? Not. That's what I do. I sit there and go, help this game, help this game. Help Chet Mono, help Chet Mono. <laughs> I got my thing on. Put the over there. What do you think? Well, I think. Attention to me. Okay, how are you? Oh my god. Nope. Alright. Hello. What's for lunch? Fruit Loops today. Well, you ate them all now. How are they? Fruity. Here's yeah, the underground crew. As a video game expert, I like Desert Falcon on my Atari 7800 because it's got great graphics, animation, and sound. As a consumer, I like it because it costs under 20 bucks. As a video game expert, I like it.